So hello, uh, everybody. Thanks, Daniel, for the invitation. It's a great honor for me to give a talk at this seminar. Today, I'll uh, report on uh, recent results in collaboration with Simone Del Vecchio, who is at Leipzig University, Germany, Jürg Fröhlich from ETH Zurich, and Stefano Rossi from the University of Bari, Italy. So these results concern uh, um, lattice quantum systems uh, in any dimensions, but for the purpose of this talk, I will uh, focus on one-dimensional lattices, that means uh, on uh, quantum chains. And uh, moreover, in order to keep my exposition as less technical as possible, I will consider the simplest situation. Therefore, in the next slides, all the operators that you will see are just finite dimensional matrices. And you can think of the problem I'm going to describe as a, a problem in a linear algebra. So what we want to do for a quantum chain, we want to study the degeneracy of the ground state energy. That means we want to study the degeneracy of the bottom eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian of the system and also its spectral gap. So the gap above the ground state energy as the length of the chain tends to infinity. So more precisely, we will consider a number tubed Hamiltonian that is already gapped in the thermodynamic limit. That means as the length tends to infinity. And then we add a perturbation that consists of terms that are locally small. And we want to check whether the spectral gap is still there as the length tends to infinity. So the physical motivation comes from uh, statistical mechanics. Indeed, uh, the cluster properties of the correlation functions of the system at temperature t equals zero, the correlation functions are expectation values of products of observables in the ground state of the system. So the cluster properties of these correlation functions are related to the spectral gap above the ground state energy. So if there is a gap, uh, these correlation functions decay exponentially in the distance between the clusters. So they tell us something about the long range behavior of the system. But in recent years, we have seen a, a renewal of interest in this topic because of the study of insulating states of matter. So if you want to model a crystal and uh, then also electron conductions, you have to consider an Hamiltonian that represents the crystals where uh, all the um, balance bands are filled. And uh, uh, if it's an insulating state, so what happens that there is a, actually a energy gap between the balance bands and the conduction bands. And uh, of course, uh, one important question is whether this situation uh, remains if we switch on uh, some interactions that are locally small. So this is uh, also related to what uh, people uh, call uh, um, quantum gap and phases of matter. So I want go into details of this topic, but I just want to mention that in the past years, we have seen a lot of activities in, in, uh, in this area. So uh, the problem is not a perturbative problem. So we want to, or they want to see whether a, an Hamiltonian, which uh, is a, like a, a quantum chain, has a, 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 a gap above the ground state energy. So, uh, in this uh, respect, I would like just to mention uh, the words by uh, Marius Lamb and co-workers where they actually studied Hamiltonians that are related to the famous AKLT model. Now, from the mathematical point of view, our task is to implement a perturbation theory for extensive systems. And uh, indeed, uh, what uh, we have done, we have introduced a new perturbative method, which is inspired by Newton iteration. 
And uh, I think the main feature of our method is that it applies both to fermions and boson. It deals with them on the same footing. And uh, concerning the main tool, our main tool is Lischwinger conjugation, but used in a local manner, as I hope it will be clear at the end of my talk. Concerning um, alternative methods to prove uh, stability results, so uh, let me say that in the past people have used cluster expansion and amongst these results, just let me mention the one by Yarosky because uh, somehow he deals with the same model we have uh, considered and uh, con he also has results for uh, unbounded interactions in general, all the results about stability gap um, gap stability, sorry, uh, are uh, restrict to interactions that are bounded. Then uh, um, another type of result uh, is, um, I mean, it's a, it's a result, of course, on the gap stability, but uh, using another method, uh, namely the adiabatic flow of Hamiltonians initiated by Hastings, and. Uh, one important ingredient uh, for this method uh, is the control of so-called uh, Lee Robinson bounds for, uh, um, for example, a spin system. And this has been uh, pushed forward uh, in the re in recent years by uh, Nachter, Gale, and Sims. Another result uh, is um, obtained by using a path integral approach for a fermionic system by Salmouf de Rook. Now concerning the tool that uh, we use uh, in our work, so the Lischwinger conjugation, I have to say that in a simpler context, this tool was used by data and coworkers in 96 for the uh, same purposes as ours, so, but restrict to fermion systems by the Rook uh, shoots they combined the Lischwinger conjugation with uh, ideas from cluster expansion. And um, also John Imbri in his study of many body localization in one dimension uh, used this tool. Okay, now let's go to the setting of the problem. So consider a chain with N sites the Hilbert space of the system is the tensor product of n copies of a finite dimensional space C to M, where M is arbitrary large, but independent of N. So as you can see, I am considering uh, just a finite dimensional space for each site J and uh, this is because I'm just considering, for example, fermion systems. Now, uh, let's consider a, Namil a Namiltonian H, I mean, uh, actually just a M by M symmetric matrix H, uh, non-negative. Assume that uh, zero is an eigenvalue of H and that the corresponding uh, eigenspace is non-degenerate. Let's call omega the eigenvector. And uh, in the following, I will also use the term vacuum state. And uh, let's assume that the rest of the eigenvalues are at a distance at least one from the bottom eigenvalue that is zero. Then uh, let me introduce a spectral projection P omega i that projects onto the vacuum subspace for the height site. So for the Hilbert space H i. And uh, on the remaining tensor factors, this projection acts as the identity. P omega perp is uh, identity minus P omega i. So now by construction, we have that this operator HI written above that acts as a Hamiltonian H on the height um, 
Hilbert space HI and uh, as the identity on the remaining Hilbert space is HJ. So this operator HI is block diagonal with respect to the decomposition of uh, the identity into P omega I and P omega perp. Moreover, of course, if we sandwich HI with P omega I, we get zero. And if we sandwich P omega I perp, uh, sorry, HI with P omega perp, we get an operator which is larger or equal P omega I perp. And this is because of the assumptions on the eigenvalues of H restrict to the subspace orthogonal to the uh, vacuum subspace. Now, from this, we get that HI is larger or equal to P omega I perp. So please keep in mind this inequality because we'll be used later. Now, what's the main result? So assume that we have an Hamiltonian KN of T, which consists of the sum of the uh, operators HI. These operators are on-site operators because they don't link uh, different sites. And um, so it's easy to um, deduce from the previous assumptions that this uh, sum of on-site operators HI as a, uh, as a ground state, a product state that consists for each factor of the vacuum state. So the corresponding eigenvalue is uh, zero and the gap above this uh, eigenvalue is one. Now we add a perturbation that consists of uh, nearest neighbor interactions. And uh, we assume that the norm of each of them is less than a constant C. Now the result that uh, we can prove is the following. For uh, small values of the coupling constant T, we can prove that uniformly in N, the Hamiltonian KN of T as a unique ground state with a strictly positive gap, delta N of T, larger or equal, for example, one half above the ground state energy. So this is uh, the main result that we prove. We want to prove this following the, the, the strategy that I'm going to describe. So we want to block diagonalize Kn with respect to the two projections P vacuum, which just projects onto the vacuum uh, state for the full uh, Hilbert space, which is the ground state of the unperturbed Hamiltonian and P vacuum perp, which is identity minus P vacuum. So we have to search for a, a, an anti-symmetric matrix SN of T such that when we conjugate Kn by E raised to SN of T, we get a new matrix K tilde N of T. And this matrix is now block diagonal with respect to P vacuum and P vacuum perp. Moreover, the inf of the spectrum of K tilde N restrict to the block associated with P vacuum perp is larger or equal the expectation value of K tilde N in the vacuum state, which is the ground state energy. Indeed, the, the vacuum state is the ground state of K tilde N and plus the, uh, the quantity delta N of T, which is uh, uh, larger or equal one half, for example. What is important, of course, that is bounded away from zero uniformly in N. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the method that we want to use. And uh, uh, in order to find to the, this block diagonalization, we use the Lischwinger procedure. So let me recall uh, briefly uh, how it works. So consider an unperturbed Hamiltonian G at the a bounded perturbation V. Assume that the spectrum of G splits into two disjoint sets and that there is a delta between them. So let's call uh, a P minus H the eigenspace associated with sigma minus and P plus H the uh, eigenspace associated to sigma plus, P minus and P plus are spectral projections. So what uh, Lischwinger tells us is that uh, for T sufficiently small, of course, depending on the gap delta, 
we can construct an operator S, which is an intermission with the property that we, when we conjugate G plus TV by E raised to S, we get a new operator G plus T V prime, where V prime, that of course depends on T, is now block diagonal with respect to P minus and P plus, like the unperturbed Hamiltonian G. So we have block diagonalized the Hamiltonian G plus TV this way. Now, how this uh, really, this method works. So S is actually given as a, a power series in uh, uh, the coupling constant T. S of J are uh, uh, operators that uh, are obtained iteratively. So the action of the conjugation E raised to S on uh, G plus TV gives uh, as an operator G plus a, a series uh, of uh, operators uh, that we call VJ. And we uh, have here actually the diagonal part with respect to the, the composition of the identity into P minus and P plus. Now assume as uh, I will uh, uh, do in the rest because this is exactly the problem that we are looking at. Assume that P minus is the projection associated with the ground state energy E of the Hamiltonian G. This uh, simplifies uh, our formula. And uh, here below you can see the relation between uh, this uh, SJ and uh, the VJ here. Uh, so you can uh, see that uh, SJ is related to the off diagonal terms of VJ. Indeed, uh, um, what uh, the method does for us is the following. Given V, uh, notice that V with J equal one uh, coincides with V. So given V, uh, S1 removes the off diagonal terms of V. But uh, this way, it produces a high order terms uh, that uh, have to be block diagonali diagonalized, high order terms in T, of course. So S2 will remove the off diagonal term of order two in T and so on. So if T is sufficiently small uh, and if V is bounded, uh, we can uh, show that this series all converge and in the end uh, we find the operator V prime. Okay, so that's uh, the um, strategy of uh, Lichwinger. So let's see how we can uh, implement uh, this strategy in uh, our problem. And uh, in order to do this, I needed to introduce uh, a notation uh, that is unfortunately uh, necessary, but it's not very heavy notation. So uh, we introduced um, subsets of subsequent sites, i, i plus one up to i plus k, and we call this uh, subset i, k, i. So this can be thought of as a, an interval of length k that has its uh, left end point at i at site i. So they are k plus one sites starting from site i uh, on the chain. Now uh, we will denote matrices that uh, are supported on uh, sites uh, belonging to iki as viki. So it means that this matrix actually acts as the identity on all Hilbert spaces HJ with J that does not belong to IKI. So it acts non-trivially only on uh, sites belonging to IKI. So in this language, the nearest neighbor interactions can be written as a sum of these uh, matrices VI1I I, one because the length is one of the interval, i is the left hand point. So we have then to sum over all these intervals contained in the chain. Just to get familiar with this notation, look at this figure. So I have drawn first the, the first five sides of the chain, one, two, three, four, five in green 
On top, I have a written the Hamiltonian. On top of each side, there is the on-site term, corresponding on-site term. And uh, in red, you see the uh, nearest neighbor interaction. So the I11 that has support on the interval I11 written above links site one to site two. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, I12 analogously uh, and the I13, the I14. I have written below the, the intervals I21. So the first one uh, starts at site one. They are intervals of length two. Uh, I22 uh, instead starts at site two. Okay, so now what's the idea? We would like to uh, implement a Lischwinger conjugation, but you see, if we collect the red terms here, their norm will diverge as, ten, uh, as the length of the chain tends to infinity, so we would be in troubles. So we cannot do th this in one shot, but we can observe that uh, locally our interaction is a small interaction because each uh, of this term is a uh, norm, these red terms is norm less than a constant. So uh, indeed what we want to do, uh, we, or what we can try to do is uh, to start to block diagonalize uh, subsets of uh, uh, um, our Hamiltonians. So let's look at these first three terms, H1, H2, and uh, um, interaction VI11. So let's uh, block generalize this, uh, uh, this um, uh, Hamiltonian corresponding to the first two sides. So the amplitude Hamiltonian will be H1 plus H2 in this uh, um, step. The eigenspaces will be uh, the vacuum subspace corresponding to the interval I. One one, so this uh, uh, omega one tends to omega two is the vacuum state corresponding to this interval. Then uh, the projections will be uh, the projections onto this uh, uh, vacuum subspace and the uh, per corresponding per projection. Now, what happens when we implement the um, conjugation that we have uh, built uh, following? Lischwinger SCP. So if we implement this conjugation, of course, the first three terms now are uh, uh, all block diagonalized. This is exactly what we want to do. Notice that starting from H3 on, of course, the uh, conjugation uh, doesn't really um, change anything because of the fact that the support of this operator S I11 is uh, this joint from uh, the support of uh, all the operators that I'm considering here within brackets. So the only term that is affected by the conjugation, uh, except for the first three, is this one that is the interaction that links site two to site three. So exactly this term corresponding to, to, to this uh, um, VI12. So now let's see what, what is the result when we conjugate the I12. The result is written in terms of a, a series. The zero order term is, uh, of course, uh, the original uh, potential, the I12. The uh, other term is uh, given as a series. AD is the adjoint action. AD1 is just the commutator of S with D. And uh, uh, for general n, it is defined iteratively. But what is really important here to note is that this uh, portion here, this uh, um, uh, that corresponds to the terms from n equal one to infinity, as in general support on a longer interval uh, of length two that starts at one i one i two one. So uh, what is clear that when we start to block diagonalize, we, uh, we create uh, effective potentials corresponding to longer and longer interval. So it's clear that we need a, an iterative procedure and we have to keep track of all these uh, terms that are created. So the strategy, the philosophy of the strategy is the following. 
So we want to block diagonalize each potential that is associated with a given interval IKQ. So for a given interval, we have a, a potential associated to it. And at some point in our block diagonalization procedure, we want to block diagonalize it. And we do this step by step, starting from shorter in intervals to longer intervals. So we first block diagonalize intervals of length one. Then after we have block diagonalized all of them, we block diagonalize those of length two and so on. And uh, for example, we can follow this order from the left to the right. But what is really crucial is that first we block generalize those that are shorter with respect to the ones that are longer. So for this reason, we have to uh, consider an ordering for our block generalization steps. And of course, this is also an ordering for the intervals. So uh, the uh, pair uh, k prime q prime is larger than kq if uh, either k prime is larger than k so if the interval associated with this pair is uh, longer than the interval associated with this or if the lengths are uh, equal if uh, this uh, the interval associated with this pair stands on, on the right with respect to uh, the interval associated with kq now on a step kq what we want to do, we want to block diagonalize the potential that at the previous step, kq minus one as support on the interval ikq. This is the interval length k and with left end point q. And of course, we have to do this block diagonalization using the two projections written here below. This is the projection onto the vacuum subspace corresponding to the interval IKQ. So to the sides uh, Q, Q plus one up to Q plus K. And this is the corresponding per projection. So uh, of course we have uh, then to uh, implement many block diagonalization step on step KQ we get uh, an operator that will have uh, in the, the following form. So notice we started just from on-site terms and uh, nearest neighbor interactions, but now we have uh, interactions corresponding to intervals of arbitrary length, but of course within the chain. And uh, notice that uh, we have a uh, blue and red terms. So blue terms are um, potentials that uh, are already block diagonalized on step KQ. Why the red terms uh, are potentials that are not block diagonalized yet, but they will get block diagonalized at the, uh, eventually at some point. And uh, uh, at the end of the procedure, all the terms will turn to blue. And notice that once a term has been uh, block diagonalized, it won't change anymore along the process. This is uh, really crucial in this procedure. So now uh, if we implement our block diagonalization of Kn Kq minus one to get the next uh, Hamiltonian Kn Kq, what is the Hamiltonian that plays the role of the unperturbed operator in the leash wing procedure? So is a, a local operator, local because uh, you see here in the definition contains only operators that have support uh, in, in uh, IKQ. And um, uh, so this is a very important because this means that when we implement the conjugation, we don't touch too many effective potentials thanks to the locality of this uh, uh, operator GIKQ. But of course, we have to make sure that this G has the, uh, the property that has to have in order to play the role of the unperturbed Hamiltonian in the Lichwinger procedure. And this is true because of the frustration free properties of uh, property of the potentials uh, B. Uh, so what this means, uh, so notice that 
if uh, this uh, interval uh, uh, corresponding to Li is uh, less or equal than uh, the index k q minus one, this is the index, this upper index uh, keeps track of the block diagonalization step. So because of the discussion that I um, did uh, for the previous slide, it's clear that this is already block diagonalized because uh, Li, this pair is less or equal than k q minus one. So, and this is block diagonalized with respect to two projections, P minus ILI and P plus ILI. So each of these potentials is already block diagonalized. Of course, uh, this inequality holds because L is strictly less than K. Remember the ordering. So we have this situation, but now there is an important fact that if uh, ILI is contained in IK and Q, then uh, this operator, which is uh, block diagonalized with respect to these two projections, is also block diagonalized with respect to the projections associated to the longer interval IK and Q. This uh, is what I call the frustration free property of these potential terms. Therefore, our Hamiltonian G is block diagonalized with respect to P minus IKQ and P plus IKQ. Okay? So now you see this slide is very similar to uh, one of the previous slides. Uh, we, I have only added the, the, the label IKQ, but is it then exactly the same that you have already seen to describe the procedure uh, by Lee and Schwinger. What I want to stress here is uh, this denominator in red that you see um, on the bottom line. So what's the problem that might arise when we implement many block diagonalization step that, so uh, E is the ground state energy of G. So this is the gap of the Hamiltonian G. What might happen is that this uh, gap uh, becomes smaller and smaller. And uh, then uh, we cannot get control of this series expansions. And therefore, uh, we have to make sure that uh, this gap remains bounded away from zero. And uh, so then uh, uh, that's somehow the, uh, the core of our method. And I think uh, it is worth to explain how it works and somehow how simple the, the mechanism is. So I've written above the Hamiltonian G. So this Hamiltonian is uh, uh, block diagonalized with respect to the projection P minus and P plus IKQ. But we have seen also that all these potential terms are block diagonalized with respect to the projection associated with the respective interval, ILJ. Okay, so this is uh, the first ingredient in our argument to control the gap of the Hamiltonian G. The second ingredient is that the sum of the on-site terms is bounded from below by the sum of the projections P per omega i for i that belongs to the interval IKQ. So you remember at the beginning, I told you to keep in mind the inequality H i larger or equal P per omega i. Here we are just using that inequality. Then there is a third ingredient that here is given as an input, but of course in the proof by induction that you can see in the paper, is uh, uh, somehow the result of uh, uh, the control on the gap of uh, the Hamiltonian G i k q minus one. So in the proof by induction, we control uh, simultaneously the gap of the Hamiltonian G and the operator norm of the effective potential. So the important fact is that this norm 
uh, of course, uh, gets smaller and smaller as uh, uh, the length of the interval gets larger and larger. Of course, because otherwise our metal could not work. And uh, indeed, uh, it goes exponentially in uh, this length L. Now, the fourth ingredient is the following one. So look at the projection on the vacuum subspace associated with the interval ILJ. Take the corresponding pair projection, which is this one. Okay, so this is a lesser or equal than the sum of all the pair projections P pair omega i with i in ILJ. So this is uh, not difficult to show this inequality, but it's really crucial in uh, our argument. Why? Okay, we need uh, one more step. Let's go back to the Hamiltonian G. Look, here we sum of uh, intervals of length L contained in IKQ. Now, if we go back to the fourth ingredient, and uh, if we sum, so this was the inequality written before, if we sum now over the interval of length L, the left-hand side of this inequality, we can bound this sum in terms of the sum of uh, all the projection P per omega i with i in the longer interval AKQ times L plus one. This is because for, uh, for each i here, for each site i, you have to count how many intervals of length L can contain this site i. And these intervals are at most L plus one. And therefore we get this estimate. Now, let's go back to the first ingredient. Remember that P minus is uh, the projection onto the vacuum subspace of ILJ, of uh, uh, corresponding to the interval ILJ. Therefore, this is just the um, projection P minus times the expectation value of V in the uh, vacuum um, state corresponding to the interval ILJ. Moreover, P minus is one minus P plus. So in the end, we can rewrite V in the following form. So with the part which is sandwiched by P plus ILJ and the part which is just a C number operator. So it's the identity times the expectation value of V in the vacuum uh, state corresponding to the interval ILJ. Now, with all this ingredient, I think it's not difficult then to uh, understand that uh, we can provide the following inequality for uh, uh, our Hamiltonian G sandwich with P plus IKQ. So look here, all the C number terms are on the third line. Okay, these are the one proportional to the identity in the first ingredient. Then uh, here we have uh, estimated the sum of the potentials VILJ using the fourth ingredient. And this TL minus one comes from the norm uh, of the potential V. And uh, here we know that the sum of the on-site terms is uh, uh, bounded from below by the sum of the projection P per omega i. But now look, here we have uh, the same operator, P per omega i, the sum of uh, the sides i of the P per omega i. And uh, now if we use again the fourth ingredient, we get easily uh, this uh, um, expression. And in this expression, notice that the term on the third line, the, the, the number within bracket, is nothing but the ground state energy of the Hamiltonian GIKQ. Indeed, if you send each GIKQ with P minus, you get exactly this number times P minus. And uh, 
On the second line, you have something which is proportional to P plus, but that is of order one. While uh, on the third line, the number uh, is, a, 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 is actually divergent, uh, this, uh, this expression as the length of the chain tends to infinity. While on the second line, uh, uh, we have that for T sufficiently small, uniformly in the side k of the interval AKQ, this number can be shown to be, for example, larger or equal one half, as we want the, in this statement of the theorem. So that's the argument to prove the persistence of the gap. So if you think of the strategies uh, to share uh, the potential terms uh, amongst these uh, operators P per omega I, and then uh, to control them uh, using the on-site terms. Okay, now let me just uh, give a, a list of the other results that we have uh, obtained the using essentially uh, the same procedure with very small modification in some sense. So we have applied uh, this method to the KTF chain. So we have studied the small perturbations of the KTF chain. And here the problem is that we have to deal with a ground state energy, which is the generate. And, uh, However, the, the degeneracy somehow is related to uh, the edge of the uh, chain. And therefore, if you consider the bulk of the interaction terms, they don't uh, remove the degeneracy of the ground state energy of the amplitude tube the Hamiltonian. And therefore we can uh, still implement our method. And in the end, uh, we can add uh, just uh, uh, the local terms that uh, are uh, uh, localized uh, near the two edges of the chain. Then uh, we uh, have extended uh, our method. Oh, excuse me, Alessandro. Yes. So in this case of a F chain, you're not starting from just single site, the sum of single site Hamiltonians. You start yeah, from you can, something. You can implement a transformation and you get actually a, a, an upper tube with Hamiltonian that is a sum of on site terms. So that's, uh -huh. uh, you, you, you can see in our paper, I mean, there is a, a, a transformation to get a, a sum of on site terms of, of course, a, in principle, a different lattice. And the, mm -hmm. the crucial point that uh, a, the, one of the size of this, I mean, one of the two edges uh, is not present in this, in this sum. And therefore we have a degeneracy, but right. uh, actually this does not play an important role uh, for implementing our method. Hmm. Then, uh, uh, thanks for asking this. Um, then uh, we have extended uh, our method to the case of abounding interactions. So for example, you can uh, think of this model. We have uh, uh, an harmonic oscillators for each side I and uh, a, a, a nearest neighbor interaction, which is uh, here that, that connects uh, the harmonic oscillators. So uh, for this model, we can uh, still uh, uh, control the, um, the, uh, the gap uh, of the Hamiltonian. And uh, what I want to stress is the following, that uh, no large field problems appear with our method. And somehow the, the reason can be easily seen in this formula that you have already uh, seen in, in, in two previous slides. So you see, in, after all, in our procedure, what really matters are these off-diagonal terms of the potential B. But this projection here is a finite rank projection. So the fact that V is an unbounded operator somehow is unessential to control our series expansions. So that's a really kind of magic, but uh, nothing uh, really uh, is an obstacle to 
proceed essentially in the same way. Of course, we have to introduce some uh, weight to the norm operators, but uh, it's uh, really a very minimal modification. Then uh, we can uh, replace our real coupling constant by a complex coupling constant. And essentially our algorithms uh, can uh, be used in the same way. And this, the, the, this way we can uh, prove uh, analyticity of the ground state energy of the physical Hamiltonian. We can uh, extend uh, our uh, method to higher spatial dimensions. And here, however, a big difference uh, is um, now uh, to be uh, somehow considered and solved. Uh, the problem is the following. Of course, I didn't have any time to explain you how to collect all the effective potentials that are created uh, and how to control uh, this, uh, this production of effective potentials. Now in one dimension, there is a, a huge simplification and that's because if you think of an interval, an interval can only grow at the two end points. So this number two is independent of the size of the interval. This is not true if you take a, an arbitrary shape in, a, a, in higher special dimensions. So uh, the problem that if you start to count the growth processes in a one dimension, they goes uh, exponentially in the uh, length of the interval, while uh, in higher dimensions, they go factorial in the number of edges of the shape. But we can take all this uh, combinatorial problem by introducing uh, uh, what we call minimal rectangles. And uh, in the end, uh, we managed to show that our procedure works also in higher spatial dimensions. Now a work in progress, we are uh, applying our method to control small perturbation of the ferromagnetic easing model. And um, here the problem is that the uh, amplitude Hamiltonian is not a collection of on-site terms, somehow like uh, in the KTF chain, but uh, we can uh, actually use the so-called domain wall representation and uh, somehow uh, we can uh, eventually deal with an Hamiltonian of the same type that we have uh, used uh, um, in this paper, the first paper of the series and that I have shown uh, in the first part of my talk. Okay, um, then I, I just want to here uh, say that these results have appeared uh, recently. Uh, the, those are the references. And uh, however, we have uh, many other results almost ready to upload. So uh, uh, that's uh, uh, very uh, active at the moment, this, uh, this work using this new method. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Alessandro. Are there questions? So what do you mean by complex, complex coupling constant? Are you treating so-called non hermitian Hamiltonians? Yes, yes. yes. We, we just mm. replaced T mm. here with a complex. Oh, uh -huh. OK. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to ask, how does it compare to, to the older work, for instance, by Jörg Frölich, uh, Data, and uh, I don't remember. Rebele yeah, I mean, uh, and Fernandez. Yes, Fernandez, yes. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, here we have uh, a systematic control of the of the gaps of this local Hamiltonian. And uh, so they, I, I would say the initial model is uh, somehow mm, here more complicated to be controlled. So it's for sure a, a, a big improvement. And uh, 
also uh, in, in that paper, they uh, usually, uh, they can't uh, really deal with um, unbounded operators. Why you see this, uh, this method, as I mentioned at the very end, uh, uh, this iterative method uh, gives the possibility to also deal with unbounded uh, interactions. Other questions? So I have perhaps one question. So you started with on-site Hamiltonian and you didn't mention that uh, there should be not too many problems to extend to uh, to perturbations of Hamiltonians which are not on-site. On -site. In fact, you never really use the fact that this is on-site. If you start with something which is finite range, which has all the nice properties in, in terms of gaps, then you can perturb uh, I mean, uh, I, th that's a good point. Uh, what is really crucial in this procedure, and that we have not managed somehow to make uh, substantial progress in this direction, is the fact that the ground state has this tensor structure, is a product state. So if, for example, if you look at the AKLT model, it, if you try to apply this method, you run a, into troubles because uh, the ground state doesn't uh, have the uh, product state uh, structure. So uh, that's, I think, uh, so far the, 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 the limitation. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's not much with the fact that uh, our on-site terms, uh, um, I mean, that not always uh, we have uh, uh, from the very beginning, a collection of site terms because, as I sh showed uh, for Kita F and uh, as I said for the ferromagnetic easing model, uh, we can somehow, uh, by a transformation, go back to the uh, usual situation. But uh, really, what we cannot at the moment, we cannot uh, um, manage to do is to to, for example, uh, control uh, small perturbations of the uh, AKLT model while uh, with other methods this has, has been done. Mm -hmm. But you only need that the, the ground state has a product state structure for the unperturbed model. Yeah, I need uh, exactly this, uh, So we, with the perturbation, it's not exactly a product state structure anymore. Uh, here it's really crucial for this uh, for this argument. So to conclude that this potential is uh, also block diagonalized with respect mm -hmm. to the projection associated to the longer intervals IKQ. Here we exploit the 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 the, the, ten, the product state um, structure of the of the vacuum state. Oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But you are kind of changing the basis. I mean, the original ground state is no longer a ground state for the Potter model. Of course, the, the, the so you, you see from the expression of this uh, Hamiltonian step KQ, we are uh, implementing many, many block diagonalization. And uh, mm -hmm. so the idea is that we keep always, uh, uh, or we tend to keep the, 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 the the, the ground state of uh, the original Hamiltonian, uh, unperturbed Hamiltonian, we want with this um, series, uh, we, with this uh, iterated conjugation, to keep that ground state uh, as a ground state of the final transformed Hamiltonian. So if you go back to the Hamiltonian Kn, of course, the, the ground state is very different from uh, the vacuum state for the uh, entire chain that is the ground state of the unperturbed Hamilton. So the, the strategy is to uh, change our Hamiltonian with this conjugation in such a way that in the end, the, 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 the final operator that we get as, as a ground state, the vacuum state, which is uh, the ground state of the unperturbed Hamilton. Thank you. Other questions?
in <clears throat> in the case where the uh, unperturbed Hamiltonian has a degenerate ground state, like the Kataev chain you mentioned, is it possible to bound splitting of the ground states when you turn on yeah, the Yeah, yeah, we can. We actually can see the splitting of the ground state. So uh, that's a good question. Uh, as I was uh, now outlining during uh, um, my comment to this slide. So uh, what we do when we have to control as small perturbations of the KTF chain after the transformation so that we get for the unperturbed Hamiltonian a sum of on-site terms. So we, uh, we actually split our interaction into two pieces. Uh, one big piece is uh, uh, given by all the uh, perturbation terms interaction terms that do not have support uh, on the site zero. So um, then uh, if, you, if you look at this uh, uh, sum of interaction terms, these uh, interaction terms do not remove the degeneracy of uh, um, that, that we have. So, because the degeneracy is actually due only to the, uh, I mean, uh, is related to the Hilbert space associated with site zero. So uh, the, the strategy is first to uh, implement our method for this uh, bulk of uh, interaction terms. And then what you get, you get, of course, uh, um, ground state subspace, which is degenerate, and the rest of the spectrum is at the distance of order one. Then uh, you consider the uh, interaction terms that have support on site zero, but they are uh, um, uh, in number, they are finite. So uh, you just implement a usual perturbation step, but they are, just a finite number of terms, you, uh, you have uh, just to uh, block diagonalize a matrix that is two by two, because the ground state subspace is uh, a two by two matrix. Uh, I mean, is a, a two dimensional subspace. Okay, and will you find the expected uh, bound that it's exponentially small in the coupling? I mean, uh, we, we have not really uh, checked uh, the uh, quantitatively what, what we can uh, do, uh, we, we can provide as optimal estimates. We are being just interested in the implementing the method and uh, maybe in future work, we will look at this uh, kind of more detailed analysis, quantitative analysis. Okay, I see. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs>